Now we're going to talk about the EM algorithm, and I want you to keep Gaussian mixture models in your mind, although I'm not specifically talking about Gaussian mixture models. It's actually a much more general setting, but uh, as long as you think about Gaussian mixture models, you'll understand why I'm doing this. Okay, so we start with data. There's x1 through xn. And then we have hidden variables, and you should, again, think of those as clusters that we don't know uh, which cluster generated which data point. Anyway, so these clusters, um, the hidden variables, take values between 1 and k. So we have one hidden variable, one, for, one hidden variable for each data point. And in this case, um, you know, each zn is a value between 1 and k telling you which cluster, sent, which cluster the point xi came from. Okay, so these hidden variables take values 1 through k. Okay, 1 through k. All right, and then we have our parameters, which are called theta. In the case of Gaussian mixture models, those parameters were the popularity of the different clusters, as well as the cluster centers and the cluster covariances. All right, and then we compute the log likelihood. For model parameters theta. And it's the log of the probabilities for the data to be what they were. So we'll have random variables x1 through xn equaling the values that they actually were given theta. Okay, so now again, we're going to use independence. You can see I already started from the log because I knew I was going to use log anyway. So here we're using independence. And this would be log of a product, but now it's sum of the logs, and that's okay. Same thing as before. And now, um, I again use the law of total probability and expand this. And this is where we ran into the issue last time, and we run into the same issue this time. Okay, writing the joint probability out. Okay, so that's the problem. That's where we stand. Okay, so the idea of EM is to find a lower bound on, on this quantity here that allows us um, to maximize it. Let me draw a picture to kind of illustrate EM. Here's our log likelihood. Which is a function of theta. And remember, we're trying to maximize the log likelihood as a function of theta. We want to find the highest likelihood values of the parameters, which in the case of Gaussian mixture models, of course, the mixture weights and the mixture centers and the mixture covariances. Okay, so we're going to construct um, an auxiliary function that is going to meet the log likelihood at the point theta t. Okay, so here is a, here's our point theta t, and we're going to construct our auxiliary function, which is a lower bound. Okay. Now you can see that if you, as long as the auxiliary function really is a lower bound, and because it meets the log likelihood exactly at that point, if we maximize the auxiliary function, the likelihood is only going to go up. Okay, so let's maximize the auxiliary function, which means we would go this way and end up up here. Okay, so maybe this is the maximum of the auxiliary function right there. 
Okay, so that's going to be our next point. That's theta t plus 1. And it meets the function here. So let's try another auxiliary function here. Okay, now maybe we'll maximize the auxiliary function. We'll end up over here. And hopefully that's kind of close to the maximizer of our log likelihood. And this guy is going to be theta t plus 2. And you hope that if you keep doing this procedure, you'll actually maximize the log likelihood. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, of course, there's no guarantee of optimality because this is a uh, this is a local procedure, so it might find a local maximum, but at least it'll get us to something better than where we were when we started. All right, so let's write down the actual procedure of how we construct this auxiliary function, which comes from Jensen's inequality. So I'm going to go and start from where we were. So in particular, I want you to look at this expression over here, which I'm going to copy over um, to the next page. Okay, so that's the log likelihood, sum of log of that of this thing. Okay, great. Okay, so now I'm going to multiply one in disguise, and I will warn you, it's a rather special one in disguise. In fact, it's the best possible one in disguise I could have picked for this problem. But let's let's just go and do that, and we'll figure it out after that. Right, here's the one in disguise. All right, great. Now at this point, we're going to use Jensen's inequality and I always forget which way Jensen's inequality goes. <laughs> so Jensen's inequality is a, a, a way to upper bound when you swap a function and, and its expectation when the function is convex. Um, so because I never remember uh, which way it goes, I always have to derive it every time. So I'm going to do that for you. So if f is convex, then either f of the expectation of x or the expectation of f of x is bigger, and I can never remember which. Okay, so let's draw the picture, because that really gives it away. The trick is to pick a convex function that's pretty steep, and then you can really see it. Not steep enough. All right, and then I'm going to make that a uniform distribution for the expectation. I'll make it a uniform distribution over some chunk of x. So this is p of x for my expectation, and this is f of x up here. OK, so what are these two quantities? So f of the expectation of x, well, um, that one, where's that? Well, the expectation of x is over here. And so f of the expectation of x is this point. So what about the expectation of f of x, well, f of x has these kind of large values in it. And so if you take the expectation of the values of f of x, well, that's probably, you know, if you, you look, you have to look on this axis now and figure out what the expect, expected value of f of x is. 
And some of those f of x values are really large. And so um, the value of the ex expectation of f of x is probably up here somewhere. All right, so now we know the answer. <laughs> we know that the that f of the expectation of x is always less than or equal to the ex expectation of f of x. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice easy way to kind of view Jensen's inequality. And the inequality works in reverse if negative f of x is, um, if, you're, if you want to deal with a concave function, you have to deal with negative f of x, right? Because if f is convex, negative f is concave. So let's write that one down. Actually, I'll write it down here. Okay, so what happens when f is the log, which is what we're actually interested in here? And the log is concave. Okay, just following the formula there. All right. We're going to apply that now to our log likelihood, and then finally we're going to get rid of that log of a sum. It's going to be the sum of a log here. Okay, so here's where we were before. And now um, I'm going to do something kind of funky, which is I'm going to call the sum of the probabilities, sum of the probabilities of outcomes, right? It's a sum of probabilities times outcomes. So therefore you can call it an expectation, right? I can call it an expectation if I want to, because it follows the definition of an expectation. So that's going to be kind of handy because you can see we have a log of an expectation here. Now we also know from Jensen's inequality here, I'll just put that in the corner there, that the log of the expectation of x is greater than or equal to the expectation of the log of x. And so we're gonna use that because we have log of expectation. Yeah, we're gonna make a lower bound expectation of log. That's, when it, that's what's gonna constitute our auxiliary function. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so log of expectation, I'm gonna switch it to expectation of log. Cool. So let me write, that, write again out what the expectation is since it, it's kind of a funky expectation there. Okay, great. And this, luckily for us, is our auxiliary function. We've arrived at the auxiliary function. Okay, great. Now, before we, before we go any further, we actually have to prove 
that we have to do a sanity check on this auxiliary function because as I drew in the other picture, um, we need to make sure that um, the auxiliary function is valid. So in other words, we need to make sure the auxiliary function hits the log likelihood exactly at the point theta t. Okay, so let's do that check next. Okay, so they have to hit each other at that point, theta t. Let's show that. I'll write down the auxiliary function again, but evaluate it at the point theta t. Okay, let's just take a closer look at that fraction here because we can make the numerator and denominator contain the same term uh, if, we're, if, we, um, if we look a little bit carefully uh, at, uh, at them using, the law, using just the law of conditional probability, the definition of conditional probability. Okay, great. So divide both sides by the denominator. And one of the terms cancels, this one. This is just one. Okay, great. So we're just left with one term in there. Let's put that in. Okay, great. Now, if you take a look at this over here, right, this, the term, this term over there doesn't depend on k, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but right, right here, what we have is a sum over all k of a discrete probability distribution over k. And so I'm summing over the whole distribution, so it's just one. And I'll write here, sum over whole probability distribution. All right, great. So what we have then is that the auxiliary function at that point theta t, it equals just the sum over i log probability that xi equals what it does given theta t. And um, so this, luckily for us, this is just the log likelihood for it's just the log likelihood for um, for the for this is just the log likelihood right this is just the plain old log likelihood. Oops. And so um, we're happy because it means that the auxiliary function equals the log likelihood at the point we um, we actually care we we're actually at which is theta t. Okay, so we showed these two functions are equal to each other exactly at that point. So now we're good. Now we can go back to doing what we were doing. Let's write down the auxiliary function first.
And actually, I wanted to highlight the fact that uh, theta is here. Okay, great. Okay, here's the E step. It's to compute these probabilities, which are going to be called gamma IK. And we want to compute this for each i and each k. And then in the m step, we're going to maximize the auxiliary function with respect to theta. Now this is the log of a over b, which is the log of a minus the log of b. And in this case, the denominator, which is b, uh, doesn't depend on theta, which is the thing we want to maximize with respect to. So in fact, um, I actually don't need the denominator at all. I can just wipe it out because that term just doesn't depend on theta. OK, so how are we going to do this maximization? And the answer is by taking derivatives and setting them to zero. Cool. So that is actually EM. That's actually the whole algorithm. Um, you might be wondering, though, why the E step is called the E step. Because here you're computing a probability and not an expectation. Well, <laughs> in fact, as we know, if we use indicator variables, probabilities are actually equal to expectations. So let me actually just write that out so you can see why it's called E. It's, it's actually the expectation of a particular indicator variable. So let's, let's write that out. Okay, so that probability is the expectation. And it turns out that if you use a particular indicator variable, which is this guy, so it's cik equals 1 if zi equals k and 0 otherwise. All right. And so if we write down um, the expectation of this guy, you're going to end up with 1 times the probability of the thing we actually care about. Plus 0 times the probability that it's 0. And so this is actually, this is actually the expectation of C. OK. So yeah, so that's why it's called, uh, that's why it's called EM, so expectation maximization. And it's a, a coordinate a coordinate ascent procedure. You um, you compute these probabilities. You compute the probability that each um, each zi equals k, and then from there you update all the the parameters, and you keep doing this alternating minimization scheme until it's converged. Okay, so now that we know this, we can go back and use it for Gaussian mixture models.